video you're about to watch has been designed to take you deeper, higher, and wider into Yahweh. Enjoy, and please subscribe. Thank you. Father, we just want to thank you and praise you for a deep, intimate time. Father, that we also are reminded that it's not that we come together to go into the kingdom of heaven, that we have been in the kingdom of heaven, that we have stepped in from the beginning of our day, from the beginning of our eyes opening up in the morning, Father, because we have already been within the kingdom of heaven in our night watch. So as we wake up afresh full of your glory, our day begins consumed with a mandate that you've been given that you have given to us for the day. We're engaging with the angelic Father God, engaging with the seven spirits so that we can be in a alignment with what needs to happen daily. So Father, when we get to a meeting like this, we are filled up with your glory, we are consumed with your presence, and we're just uh, allowing our spirit man to download into our soul and body what it's been doing, what it's been engaging in for the day. So Father, we want to thank you and praise you and honor you for the fullness of your glory that we get to walk in. The fact that we get to come back into the atmosphere as spirit beings consumed with, with your fire, with revelation, with insight, with knowledge, with your presence, with your glory, and breathe it into the atmosphere, Father, as the covering cherub would, would release the glory and revelation that comes from the, 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 the fullness of your throne of mercy, Father. And we breathe that into creation. We breathe it into the city that we live in. We breathe it into the state that we live in, Father. We breathe it into the country and into the nations of the world. And Father, as sons and daughters all over the, the world doing the same thing, there's an alignment and a, a build-up of your presence and image that has never been on the face of the earth. This is a time and season where sons and daughters are beginning to reveal the fullness of who you are to creation and it's bringing an alignment. It is incredible, Father. It's incredible to come to an end of a year stepping into a new dimension of revelation and intimacy as you open up gateways and doorways for us as the Ecclesia to go into a new year full of absolute supernatural experiences with you and reminding ourselves that we are going deeper and deeper and deeper into intimacy, deeper and deeper and deeper into relationship with you. We're getting to know our daddy, we're getting to know Yahweh in his full capacity and it is incredible, Father. We thank you and we praise you for it, Lord. Yeah. I ask, Lord, you will bless everyone in this room tonight with the fullness of revelation as we go to a place with you that you have longed for for such a long time. We love you, we praise you in the name of Yeshua. Yeah. Amen. Let it be light. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to try and do tonight um, is I want to, I don't know, but for the last couple of days or last couple of weeks, I would go as far as to say that the Father has really put an emphasis on intimacy with Him, especially in my own life. And I know that it's coming across in everything I do because I believe that we walk in a timeline where the Father pours into us what He needs for the time and season we're in. Yeah. Now, I say that, but remind yourself, God doesn't have a time and season like we do. Right. That He lives outside of time and space. Yeah. So we adapt to where we act. His desire for us is to live in our tomorrow so we can experience everything He pours into us all the time. Yeah. But because we are bound to the sun and the moon, because we haven't taken authority yet, we haven't overshadowed like we're supposed to yet, where we live outside of time and space, but because we operate out of the fullness of the light of Yeshua. Right. Right? We understand that if you operate at the speed of light, you operate outside of time and space. And we begin to understand that the Father has opened a dimension to us through the blood of Yeshua, that we get to operate in the fullness of the light. Mm -hmm. right? So that we understand that right here, right now, He's giving us uh, part of His heart. And part of His heart is intimacy with Him. Becoming a friend of God. Right. Now, I look, at, I look at the man and the woman that walked intimately with him where Yahweh said, this is my friend. And we're looking at Adam. We look at Enoch. We look at Moses. David. Elisha. And there's more. Abraham. John. Abraham. Abraham, yes, but, but not to the full extent. Right? And if you look at Abraham's descendants... They would say, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's close, but it's personal. And yes, Abraham had a great relationship. And I wouldn't exclude him, don't misunderstand me. 
But there was just a company of people in the Old Testament and some in the New Testament that really stepped up uh, behind the norm. Right? Moses, I would go as far as to say, was one of the most incredible stories I've ever, ever read. Right? And he was so close to God that he could tell God to repent. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty close, right? But you know, there's, now, now, Enoch is a whole different ballgame. Right? Because there's hardly anything really spoken uh, about him. So we don't know much. But if you listen to the small little portions in the Word of God that talks about him, it was intense. He was a friend of God. He walked with God, like Adam, but in a different dimension. Right. You know, he was... Uh, at a place where we really don't fathom because according to my understanding, well, Yeshua had to be slain in the flesh first for me to be able to even have access back into the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Yet through intimacy and relationship, Enoch got to go in. Wow. Yeah. Same with Moses. Why could Moses do what he did? Because he was a friend of God. Wow. You know, he's raised in this heathen nation he becomes a prince in a heathen nation, and then he's, of course, uh, raised by his own mother. How I many of you know that? Right. He's raised by his own mother. She's telling him that you're actually a Hebrew. Right. You know, and in his youth, he's raised by, by the king um, of, of Egypt. And so he comes to this place in his life where he rebels against what he was birthed into. Or, 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 or uh, not birthed into, more like... Uh, Customs and his, uh, his traditions he was uh, grown into. Right. He, gets, he gets to run away and in the time that he's away from all this, 40 years. Right? By the time he was 40 years old, he was cast out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. So he became a um, shepherd. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should just become shepherds. Yeah. Right? Like if you listen to all these shepherds, they're like incredible men of God, right? Um, he becomes a shepherd for 40 years. Now, this makes him 80. <laughs> but at the time that he's a shepherd, he seriously grows in intimacy with Yahweh. Yeah. Right? By the time he's 80, he gets to meet Yahweh uh, at a burning bush face to face. Wow. Now, we are reminded that the burning bush wasn't a strange thing. Right. The strange thing about the bush is that it didn't burn out. Right. That's why he was drawn to it. Right. So he gets there and he begins to engage with Yahweh in his full capacity. Before you know it, he's caught up with the mountain and they are going into the fullness of the kingdom of heaven. The full supply of heaven, the third heaven, as uh, Paul would teach. Right. And Moses gets to spend 40 days full on face to face with Yahweh. He comes down the mountain and to such an, such an extent the glory is revealed that uh, as you read the original it says, horn-like appearances is uh, uh, coming from his face. Right. Meaning that it's changing, lion marks evil man. Wow. There's lightning and fire coming out of him, and we understand to such an extent that he could smash the golden cow to powder. Yeah. Wow. Now you have to understand, that's impossible. Yeah. You have to burn with a minimum of 5,000 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Which is um, more than Fahrenheit. So if it's in Fahrenheit, it would be like 10,000. Maybe a little bit less, but it's, 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 it's crazy. For a human being to burn to that extent, you'll die. It'll just be ashes. Right? So his spirit man had to overshadow his soul and his body for him to burn with that dimension of the fullness of Yahweh. And then, of course, he smashes the, the, the golden cow, the golden calf, but he has to go back in because he also broke the, the stones with the commandments on it, the ketubah. Then he gets to spend another 80 days, another 40 days with Yahweh, face to face. Yeah. <laughs> in this time, now, now, the first 40 days, he gets to a place where he says to Yahweh, because Yahweh says, look at what your people are doing. And he's like, no, 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 no. It's your people. It's your people. And he's like, well, I'm going to smite them. I'll just use the next generation. And he's like, no, 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 no. you have to repent. <laughs> He's telling God to repent, and I'm thinking God goes, excuse me. <laughs> but it's because there's a relationship. You know, if you spend 40 days in someone's presence, it's just you and him or her, you become intimately known to each other. Okay. Right? I mean, me and my wife have been together for 20 years. Now, we haven't been married for 20 years, we've been dating for 5 and married for 15. So we've been together for 20 years. We know each other intimately. 
Now, I know that's not much when most people have been married for longer, some less, but, but you get to know somebody when you spend a lot of time with them. Right. This is just 40 days. But in the life of Moses, you get to see that he spent a lot of time with Yahweh. Matter of fact, the Lord gives him a blueprint where he can go into a tent and spend face-to-face -face time with him. That's intense. And matter of fact, it gets to such a point in his life that he dies. And the only created being on the planet, Moses gets to take his body into heaven with him after he died physically. That's relationship. Yeah. Right. Even, even Elijah, uh, Eli Elijah, Elisha, Elisha dies and his body is laid in the ground. Moses had an intense friendship with Yahweh. I love that. You know, I love that the Father desires to walk with His people in that measure. Yeah. You know, I remember myself and my wife, um, before we started dating, I was dating a lady, and she was dating another man, and we just became good friends. Eventually, um, I broke up, she broke up, and we were still friends for about six months. She was my receptionist. <laughs> I was the manager of a gym. Um, quite a big gym in South Africa, and uh, we just became really good friends. And one night we went out together to a nightclub, and um, we kissed. And it was strange. It was like kissing your best friend. Right. And it was weird. And, and so of course our relationship took a change from friendship, uh, phileo, to something more intense, eros. Right. 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 And now it's at the point where I really truly believe it is agape. You know, and we have trusted each other to such an extent there's nothing that she can do uh, knowing her, trusting the God in her that will offend me, that will get me to the point where I will love her less. And I know that for her it's the same thing. And it's a process of growth in intimacy, and that's what the Father is calling the body of Christ to. Right? There's a period of training we have to go through in order to sit in the seat of rest, the place of government and to bring the kingdom authority into our lives. And it's that place of training, meaning the Father desiring a more intimate relationship with you. That it's not about the stuff. You know, the church has made everything we do about the gifts. Uh, if you can operate out of the gifts, there's an anointing. But how many you understand, the gifts are irrevocable. No matter what your life looks like, your gift is going to continue to operate. Matter of fact, if you go to um, the French quarters, you will see the gift of divination all over the place. Matter of fact, they sit there and they can tell you your fortune. They can tell you your past, your, your right now, and tell you what's going to happen in your past. And it will come to pass. And they are operating out of the gifts. They're not born again, but they have the gifts. But if, they get, if, they, if they get born again, they will operate in that gift. If you look at men and women of God in the ages that we've been in already, so many have fallen, yet they, they just continue to operate in the gifts. Right. Now I say they, and we can all be in that boat. I'm not, right. not, not saying it's about, oh, I'm never going to fall. I, by the grace and mercy of God, I'm surrounding myself with His presence and His glory. I no longer want to operate in the gifts, I want to operate in the Spirit. Yes. As a friend of Yahweh. Amen. Now I have no problem with the gifts, I think the gifts are incredible. I mean, Absolutely mind-blowing. Have you ever seen the dead raised? It is incredible. You know, I remember the most incredible thing I've ever seen, and it really probably wasn't even all that incredible, but I saw a video of a, a young man, an uh, African gentleman, with anal cancer. Uh, extreme anal cancer. So he was dying on the side of the road, and some people that was on their way to church dragged him with them. So they put him on a, on a cloth, and they dragged him to the church. Now, the, the, the hole in his bum was this big. Now, you think to yourself, well, that, that's ridiculous. It can't possibly be that big. You could see the bones, his hip bones. He was busy on his last leg, dying. So he gets to this place, the guy lays hands on him, starts praying over him, and within two weeks, and they recorded daily, and they made a video of it. Within two weeks, he has got these perfect two little bum cheeks. Now, you think, why wasn't it instant? <laughs> I don't know, but it, it took two weeks and it's so incredible, it's amazing. You know, I, I, I've seen so much in my walk with Yahweh, so the gifts is incredible. Don't ever think that I'm against the gifts, or even against the church. But we have to grow in intimacy, we have to grow to where the Father wants to take us. Yeah. Right? We are no longer servants. 
We're no longer bond servants. <laughs> we have first to give up control of ourselves and learn to be, uh, we have already given up control of ourselves and we have learned to be servants and stewards. We have learned this already and that's in the, in the church age. How many of you remember? I was a servant of Yahweh most of my Christian walk. Then I became a bond servant. And it sounds great, and it is great, but that's not the level of intimacy the Father is calling to. You know, he's talking about being a bride, he's talking about being my body, and we're still stuck on being servants. Right. Wow. <laughs> but beyond that, God wants us to become friends. Yeah. He wants you to step into a dimension of friendship with Him that goes beyond do's and don'ts. Right. Stop eating of the tree of good and evil. And jump into the tree of life. Yes. In all this process, we are gradually getting to know the ways of God. Friends enjoy a measure of revelation that stewards and servants do not. This season, and I always say season, we're outside of time and space. Where we are in creation right now, the Father is desiring a company of people that will be so intimate with Him that He can share anything with them and trust them with all that He gives. That's why it says, friends enjoy a, a measure of revelation that stewards and servants don't have. On this side of the veil, the Father will only reveal some. But as soon as we step into His kingdom, where He is, where He's at, at home, now don't misunderstand me, He's at home all, 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 all over because He's omnipresent. But there's a kingdom, there's a realm where the fullness of Yahweh dwells. And through the blood of Yeshua, we get to go there. <coughs> Being a friend of God um, comes through relationship, but it also comes about through obedience, as we will see soon. See, we have to understand, the Father has called us. Now, when I say obedience, we think of commandments, and you have to align with these commandments. right? But obedience is in covenant. My wife has never told me, baby, don't cheat on me. Right? So... Because she's never told me this, does it give me right to go cheat on her? Right. right. There's a covenant in marriage that leads to obedience, but obedience is not a request that I'm submitting to. Right. The obedience is in covenant of the relationship. Because it's my wife, it's obvious that I don't cheat on her, I don't hurt her, I don't bring harm to her in any way, fashion or form. Right. I love her unconditionally no matter what happens. And it doesn't have to be spoken. She doesn't have to remind me of our marriage vows every time she sees me. And I don't have to do it with her. It's in the obedience of our covenant. So I want you to understand that when it talks about obedience. The Father is not sitting there saying, well, you were disobedient, so I don't want to be your friend. That's what the three and four year olds do. So my, my, my daughter is six and my son is, is four. And Hannah is sitting on the couch this afternoon and Eden is playing with his uh, dump truck. And why he likes, it was actually a garbage truck. Why he loves the garbage trucks, I don't know, but he always wants a new garbage truck. So he's sitting on the, on the table, a little, um, you know, the uh, dining room, a uh, lounge table, and he's playing with his dump truck. And Hannah is sitting on the truck, on the couch, and she says, Eden, play with me. Eden, play with me. And he ignores her flat. Like he's not even paying her attention. She starts crying. Because she wants him to play with her. He's ignoring her. And I, I realized when I was sitting there listening to that, I said, Hey, Eden, Eden. And he's just busy doing his own thing. She's having a tantrum because he doesn't want to play with her. It's, it's like the father is calling out to a company of people that doesn't want anything to do with him. Be my friend. Don't just pray prayers out of ritual. Don't come meet with me on a Sunday only. Don't just read my word and make it the all in all. Engage with me. Right. Get to know me. You know, one, once I got to know him and I went through the scriptures that I was bound to in theology, they changed. Wow. Yeah. The meaning changed because there were scriptures in the Bible I just couldn't understand. Um, if you don't bear fruit, 
I will cut you off and throw you in the fire. How many of you know that scripture? I mean, doesn't that freak you out a little bit? It's like a vicious God. I mean, if you don't bear fruit, I will, I will cut you off and throw you. Like, you know, like saying, talking about the vine. If the vine doesn't bear fruit, well, we cut off that branch and we toss it in the fire. You know, I got so freaked out by that when I got to know my father. I thought to myself, that's not my heart. That's not his heart. That's not my daddy's heart. So I asked a friend of mine that's in the, in the wine makery, and I said, listen, why do you guys cut the branch off if it doesn't bear fruit? And he says to me, we'll never do that. How many of you understand a, a vine don't need a root? Right. You can cut it off, stick it on the ground, water it, and it will grow roots and grow. Right. So he says to me, no, that, we don't, that we don't ever cut a branch off that doesn't bear fruit. What we do is we cut the branches that does bear fruit and the branches that does not bear fruit. And after we cut them, we bind them together. Wow. And we lift them up off the ground and they will sprout Fruit, because the ones who does bear fruit grows into the ones that does not bear fruit, and they will all start growing fruit. Awesome. So when they say we cut the branch and toss it in the fire, that's not what it was meant. That's not the heartbeat of the Father. That's not. That's our interpretation. That's the Greek mindset. You don't bear fruit. That's it. Get out of here. But the heartbeat of the Father is to bind us together. That's why the coming together of the saints is crucial. Not going to a building and making that the all in all. Oh, you didn't go to church on Sunday. Ho, 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 ho. Uh, see, hell for you, brother. <laughs> it's the coming together of the saints because that lifting up and cutting is the growing together. Right. You know, I look at the Father and he says, he says, you know, when you go two, two by two to a house and they reject the gospel, uh, shake the dust off your feet and take your peace and leave. Right, and our, our perception is, well, you know what, if you don't want to hear the gospel, if you don't want to receive what I got, then, then do, 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 you, I'm out of here. Yeah. Maybe not quite like that, but that's kind of where we act. Yeah, exactly. And I, I look on Facebook, great man of God is writing messages on that fact. Mm. And I couldn't perceive that. And I said, well, that's not the heart of my father. I just can't see him do that, because I got to know him as a friend. So I got into the culture, and the culture makes a whole different statement. The culture says where the rabbi would take his disciples and bind them to him, literally. And they will walk in the way that he does, and they will talk in the way that he does. They will do everything he does, but the favor comes upon the one that walks behind him. And the one that walks behind him gets to gather the dust from his shoes at the bottom of his robe. And in the Hebrew culture, it represents the blessing, the honor, the favor. It represents the blessing and the, 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 the everything that comes off the rabbi falls onto the second one walking behind him. Right. So when Yeshua said to his disciples, shake the dust off your feet, he's saying, leave the best behind. Bless them. Give them favor. Pray over them. Leave them the blessings. Don't take your peace. Leave your peace. Because that's what the Father brings. And, and it only came through realizing that this is not my Father's heart. I must have it wrong. Yeah. You know, you know, how can all the preachers on the planet be wrong? Because they got it from someone else. They got it wrong from someone else. They got it wrong from someone else. They got it wrong. That's what theology is. It's not the study of God, although that's what it means. But it's the study of what the previous generation believed of God. The traditions of men, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Father just wants a company of people that is willing to become His friends. Wow. <laughs> he wants to share secrets and mysteries. He wants to reveal to you a deeper place. That's why He tore the veil. That's why Yeshua um, cleansed us so we can go through the blood of Yeshua into the kingdom of heaven and be seated in heavenly places. Mm -hmm. So we get to live and move out of our being in Him. Right? And so we can live from out of who he is into the earth. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I love that. Greater love has no man than this, that one lay down his life for his friend. You are my friend, and if you do what I command you, see, the Father's desire for us is to begin to understand how desperate he, he wants to pour into you. How desperately he wants to reveal his secrets, his, his, his hidden parts 
to you. Now, our Greek perception of hidden parts is the, that which is revealed under my clothes. But the Father doesn't have any of that. So His desire is to reveal to you that which has been hidden to generations. Why? Because those who have not been intimate with Him will not receive the fullness of the revelation He wants to reveal. You know, Yeshua stands in front of the crowds and he preaches the message and they're like, wow, it's awesome. But then his disciples at a later stage go to him and say, uh, 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 what did you mean? We have no idea what you're talking about. Everyone's saying, oh, this was incredible. You're so powerful. You speak with such authority. But meantime, back at the ranch, they have no clue what he's saying. So the close ones, the ones that's knitted to him, gets a deeper revelation. He said, well, let me explain to you. And he goes, blah, 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 blah. But then we have the three that breaks away from the twelve when Jesus wants to be alone and they follow him everywhere he goes. And they get an even deeper dimension of revelation because he pours into them the secrets and the mysteries. There's a company of people that does that. Like Enoch, a true friend of God. Moses, uh, Moses Adam getting to walk with, with Yahweh in the cool of the day. Now you have to remind yourself that Yeshua, through the blood, restored that position for me to enter back in again. Wow, but I don't want to be like Adam, I want to be like the fullness of Yeshua, which is a new creation. Yeah. When we surrender, He is able to bring us into a place of intimacy and fellowship and revelation where He reveals things to us that have not been revealed. Yeah. Now you have to understand, if He says this statement, this is one statement, He says, you'll do greater things than I've done. It can't stop there. Because if I'm, if I'm going to do greater things than Yeshua, then I'm going to hear different things than what he heard. Right. <coughs> because for me to do something different, I have to hear something different. Right. For me to do something different, I have to see something different. Yeah. Right. Which means I'm going to see aspects of God that Yeshua on the earth didn't see. Oh, well, 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 well it's, it's a logic because if I'm going to do greater things, he says, I only do what I see my father do. Right. So if he's saying I'm going to go do greater things, then I'm going to see greater things my father has done and haven't been revealed yet. Right. <coughs> now, let me explain this. We haven't seen greater things than what Yeshua has done. Why? Uh, because we haven't walked with him in the measure that he's desired. Right. We've been servants. And bond servants, right. babies. What I love about a baby is you can talk to him about anything. Yeah. <laughs> you can share anything you want. Yeah. Look, yeah. I, I don't particularly want to say what denomination I'm talking about, but there's churches in the earth that you can go preach anything you want to. And they'll go, hey man, hallelujah, praise God. Yeah. <laughs> I remember sitting in a church and they brought in a revivalist. But he asked me to bring a short teaching before the revivalist comes up. So I'm in the age of Zion in a congregation that's literally stuck in the church age. I do my message, uh, teaching on the body, soul, and spirit being intimate with him, stepping into the kingdom of heaven. And the, the, the three that enjoyed that message were in awe. The others went, amen, hallelujah. The pastor went, amen, hallelujah. But what they were waiting for was the revivalist. Right. So he comes up and he starts preaching on absolutely nothing. But he has a tone in his voice. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and he's saying nothing and nothing's coming out of his mouth, I'm sitting there going, Jesus, help me. I get so frustrated, it's so irritating, I, I want to vomit. That's how bad it was. The church is ramping and raving and jumping up. The pastor is jumping up, running for his saying, this is revival. And I'm sitting in the back there, I'm thinking, what, what, what are you talking about? He hasn't said anything that makes sense in any way, fashion, or form. He's brought the church to a height by changing his voice and his tone. Right. And he's quoted some scriptures out of line, out of proportion. It made no sense. Why are you raving about this? Because that's what a baby does. Yeah. Right. 
<laughs> the Father is looking for a company of people that will go into what He has made available. Yes. Not just running into tradition. What was there previously and say, oh, it's great, it's wonderful, it's the best we've ever had. No, it's the same as every other generation. Yeah. They bring a new thing. He's raising the dead. No, he's raised the dead from the very beginning. Yeah. He's desiring a people that will step into him. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Let me tell you something, when I first started going into the kingdom of heaven, I went into a specific room, I called it the room, the tre treasury room. It might be called something else, it might be something else, but in this room, I went, went in with, with one of the angelic beings that was walking with me, and I couldn't quite get in, I couldn't understand why this room was so packed out. It was so full they couldn't even get into it. And I said to him, what is this? Because I realized it was revelation. It was the stuff that was being revealed to me in that specific time that I was walking with Yahweh. And it was this stuff. There was divine soul and spirit. And it was just revelation being poured in. It was like, wow, where has this revelation been? Why have we not been taught this? Why had I, did I go through four um, uh, Bible schools, uh, my bachelor's degree, associate's master's degree, uh, Bible school, um, School of Supernatural, and none of the stuff has ever been taught. Where has it been? And he said to me, well, this room has been sent into the earth several times. It's been empty several times, emptied out several times. But the leaders of the day send it back. They reject it. If you go into that room today, you'll find it to be slightly emptier. Because there's a company of people that's walking within the Father's heart at a higher depth. Saying, yes, Lord, we'll do it. Yes. We'll run. He just needs one. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I bring such honor to Ian Clayton, Justin Abraham. If you, if you look at the lives of the... Now, I'm just, I'm just mentioning two. There's several others. Mm -hmm. Several, several other men and women of God doing the exact same thing. Incredible in the nation. But the two favorites that I can think of right now is Justin Abraham. The rejection that he went through. The things that he goes through is because of what he preaches and what he teaches and what he lives like. Because it's so connected to New Age, it's so connected to all the other religions out there that we have cast it away and said it's all Satan. We don't really understand. Satan can't create anything new. He can take what is out there because he was a covering cherub, which means every knowledge and understanding and revelation that's in him came from the throne of Yahweh. And he gained it and kept it instead of releasing it into creation. Right. So he can have you trade into him and he will give you some of that revelation. Right. And he does that into other, crea uh, other religions. Mm -hmm. And so the truth is, what is out there is a perverse truth. Right. Once we take it back and we realign it, it's a truth that will set you free. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Papa. So there's a company of people that's beginning to receive the revelations in the earth that the Father is wanting us to align and take back. My spiritual father shared a very short message on, uh, on uh, uh, Facebook this afternoon where he said, let's take back holidays that Satan has. He, he's got nothing to himself. It's not allowed in my kingdom to have him have his hand on anything. That's, right. That's mine. Amen. That's right. So slowly but surely, the sons of Yahweh, the friends of Yahweh, will begin to understand what belongs to them and take it back. Yeah. He wants to entrust us with, with inside knowledge and revelation. He wants to reveal to you things that's never been revealed in the face of the earth. You cannot contain him to one book. That's right. Yeah. Now, I love that book. I've studied it, meditated on it, and I still do. But that's just one portion of the word, right? Right. Now that we are spirit beings, we get to go into different dimensions. We're seeing a different dimension of the word. Right. And he wants to bring that to knowledge because he says, my people die. So there's a resurrection that he wants to bring to his sons and daughters. Yeah. And that's by pouring knowledge and understanding revelation into us. Right? right? Yeah. 
This will give us an advantage to the world around us. We will have the favor of God upon us. Because of our faithfulness as servants and stewards, He will now trust us with those intimate secrets He wants to share with us. Jesus is the Lord. We learn how to be a servant and um, do the works of God through engaging with Yeshua. If you look at Him, He, he is the perfect example of what I need to grow into. The perfect example of what I need to grow into. But in the same breath, he wants you to not just look at his life in the earth. He wants you to step into him and go where he is right now to see what he does because that's what I need to do. That's why the veil is torn. He then, as we engage with him to this level, he then starts to entrust us as stewards with more resources and responsibility. We'll quickly begin to understand that in the kingdom of heaven, as a son and a daughter, your main function is responsibility. Right. And the Father's desire is to give you more responsibility. Right. Because on your scroll, you were destined to walk out certain things. Now, you remind yourself, He created you to be co with Him. Right. Now, He runs all creation. Right. Right. What do we run? We struggle to run our own lives. Right, and we struggle even more to run our family lives. We struggle even more to run our businesses, to run your work life. You know, there's so much chaos around us, and we are reminded tonight that he wants you to be co with him. Run creation with me. <laughs> but, but we want to go to church on Sunday and pray a little bit during the week, but not really because it's just work. So if I say, Lord, I love you, you're beautiful, you're wonderful, I love you for a wonderful day, thanks for all my family, thanks for my kids, thanks for my job, you're wonderful, thanks for supplying my needs, thanks for forgiving my sins, how oh, wonderful, I love you, I pray for Jesus, amen. And that's relationship, that's my religion, that's what I am, yes, I'm Christian, amen, thank you, that's wonderful. But I'm understanding a little bit more to it than that. <laughs> He shares his heart with us as we become friends. We begin to learn the ways of Yahweh. We engage with the Holy Spirit and learn to recognize his voice and to learn the things of the Spirit. Now I want to remind you of something. The church age has taught us to hear his voice this side of the veil. Right. The age of Zion is a time where we step into the mountain of the Lord where he will teach you. Yes. Isaiah 2. That company of people where he will teach you his ways. Yeah. And, and let me tell you, in the kingdom of heaven, there's no voice speaking to you. Hey, Gustav, I needeth you to come us here. <laughs> there's a knowing. Why? Because what we're doing right here, right now, is a lower form of communication. The reason we talk like this is because of sin. Right. In the restoration, we get to understand each other's thoughts. Yeah. We get to engage as one being because we are the body. Right. How are you guys doing? Great. But because we're in the process of restoration, we can't even get to the place in our walk as sons and daughters of Yahweh where we kiss. Because he says, well, greet your brethren with a holy kiss. We struggle with hugs. <laughs> because anything closer than that, well, it might lead to adultery. Because the Father wants us to begin to see who we are. But all we see is what we're surrounded with. That's why I said, well, come up here. Uh, enter in. I've, I've torn the veil. I've given you access through my son's blood. Enter in and live in me. Move in me. Have your being in me. Become my friend so I can reveal to you the things you need to know. Because if I can read who you are, you know, um, I remember <coughs> just the other day I was asked by a friend of mine to go pray over his two daughters. So they were in a hotel. I got there. He was there. I prayed over them. I said to the one lady, and this is just not a gift. They were operating. I was in the spirit, and I looked at her life, and I saw something that bothered me. And I said to her, please, in the next week, go see your GP. There's an infection in your kidney. I wasn't operating out of gifts, I saw it in the spirit. She said to me, oh no, there's nothing wrong with my kidney. And I said, okay, well, that's just what I saw. I believe the Father wants to bring you to a place of healing before you get 
to the hospital. She did not appear. A week later, she ended up in hospital. <coughs> and it's not to boast in who I am. It's to make you understand the Father has made us one. <coughs> it's the baptism of unity. Where we are the body. Right, right. I am my own person, but in reality, we are the body of Christ. Right, right. We are what we call the bride. We are in covenant. We need to love each other and know each other yeah. by the Spirit. Right, right. You know, I, I, I know everyone in this room pretty good-ish. But I've never sat with you and spoke with you for longer than an hour, personally. Right? But in the spirit, I know where each and every single one of you are at. Not because I am super spiritual, but because in the spirit, all things are revealed. Now, the Father does not reveal sins in the spirit realm. How do you understand? In the kingdom of heaven, there is no um, record of sin. And the Father doesn't go around telling me, oh, so that guy's in adultery, and this guy is struggling with pornography, and that lady is doing this, and this is going on. Help him. He doesn't do that. He shows me where you're meant to be. I remember this specific time, uh, I was sitting in a meeting. I was leading the meeting. It was just a, a house gathering with uh, a, a group of, of, of addicts. Um, I would go there every Monday. I would do the, 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 I'd teach the ladies in the, in the afternoon, and I'd go um, teach the men later in the evening. So I'm sitting in the house with the ladies, it's just me and about 15 ladies around me, and I begin to teach. And it's always on warfare. And while I'm in the teaching on warfare, this one little lady begins to growl. She jumps up, starts punching this poor lady next to her, freaks out, picks up the table, and she runs to me, and she wants to throw the table at me. But she can't move the table, she can't throw the table at me. Eventually, everyone's freaked out, they run outside, this little girl runs into her bedroom, <clears throat> I get there, and uh, there's another guy that comes in, and I look at this guy, and I say, you need to leave. Because this girl is flashing and opening her uh, clothes up, and I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, I need to bind Satan, but instead of binding Satan and casting out the devil, I begin to prophesy over her. Now, she's slithering around the room like a snake, wanting to do all kinds of weird things, and, and there's another lady with me, so it wasn't just me, it was me and another lady, and then this guy comes in, and the Lord tells me, to ask the guy to leave. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, what he was into, I don't care per se, but as he leaves, the Father says to me, don't, don't cast the demon out like you would always do, mm -hmm. speak life to her, speak out of the kingdom of heaven into her, and I start prophesying over her who she is. Who she is called to be, not who she is right now, right. who she is called to be. Right. And immediately, the demon in her goes like this. <sighs> and she holds my hand and starts crying snot and tears, stands up there completely free. Wow. And I did not cast any demon out, I just spoke life to her. Wow. Well, because it's the love of God that casts out all fear. Right. Not the judgment. Not as a prophet, oh, the man coming back in the back room. I remember a friend, a friend of mine says to me, oh, this is how I got born again. I came into the church a little bit late, and the prophet in front screamed in front of the whole congregation, hey, you, you're addicted to pornography, repent or die. <laughs> it was true. But if I look at his ministry today, I'm freaked out by it. Because it's based on fear, it's based on a religious system that has no life. Wrong foundation. Wrong foundation. Exactly. You know, I never came to the Lord with fear in my heart. Yeah. When he called me to come into the kingdom, he made this statement. I remember sitting in the car with one of my girlfriends, and uh, I was just, to be honest, just trying to get into a, you know, I was a, a, I was a player, yeah. that's a nice way to say it. And I loved her and I just started dating her. She was a tentful nerd girl, never kissed anybody, never held anybody's hand. I remember sitting in the car and uh, I said to her, I love you so much. Uh, you're so incredible, I, blah, blah, blah. And she looks at me and she says, and I said to her that she's number one in my life. And she's a Christian girl, she looks at me and she says, you know, God should be number one in your life, not me. That burst my bubble. But I remember several months later, I was at a Christian camp with her. 
And um, everyone's jumping up and down, praising God. And I really just want to leave to go smoke a cigarette. And I was a rebel. I was there with my car. Uh, I had some alcohol in my car. A friend of mine was there with me. But I was sitting in this, clap, in this place where everyone was clapping and shouting and worshiping God. And I heard the audible voice of Yahweh. And I wasn't even born again yet. And it said to me, who is number one in your life? And I remember what she said to me, and I realized, well, it, it can't be her, because that doesn't make sense. So I said to the Father, looking at the people worshiping around me, I said, I want it to be you. Yeah. And I, that's the night I gave my life to Jesus. Oh. That's how my relationship started. He said, I just want you to have me in your life as number one. Wow. And of course, from that day, everything changed, because everyone else, uh, the love I had for them enhanced. He didn't point out my mistakes and my faults and how bad I am. The Holy Spirit's there to lead us to a deeper intimacy with Jesus. He doesn't promote himself, but he leads us to Jesus. Jesus becomes a higher dimension within our lives because the Holy Spirit shifts us into that place. That's why the Trinity is so important. Now we have to understand something. Because Jesus said, I have to go so I can send Holy Spirit, doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is less than Jesus. Right. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that Jesus said, well, see, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about the Father because you're going to get to the Father through me. doesn't mean the Father is at a higher place than what Jesus is. Right. Now, we might say, well, you know, the Father is the Father and Jesus is the Son. There, there's a difference between the two. See, that's a Greek mindset. Right. Right. But when you step into the kingdom of heaven, it's Yahweh. And Yahweh is represented through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right. But it is one God and three different entities and three different characteristics. Right. And His desire for us is to get to know Him. That's why we enter into the Yacht, the Hay, the Vav, the Hay. We step into the four faces of Yahweh. We engage with Him. You begin to understand that He desires for you to become Lord. Now, well, when I become Lord, um, because see, He is Lord of Lords. He can't be Lord of Lords if I'm not a Lord. Right. So for me to become Lord, I have to give Lordship over to Him. Right. Jesus is Lord of Lords, and we are the Lords of whom He Lord, or who He is Lord over. Right. But I, mean, I become a Lord when I give Him Lordship over my life. That's right. And in giving Him Lordship, I go into a closer place with Him regarding intimacy. That's that place of obedience. Of course, he desires for us to become kings. His desire for you is to enable us to be lords who govern with authority and power, and we start to administer the principalities of the kingdom. That's his desire, because you're co ed with him. Right. And in you growing into lordship, you also step into kingship, you begin to step into a dimension of who you are as a son. <coughs> but his desire in your growth in deeper levels of intimacy is so that you can govern that which you are to be um, responsible for. Does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs> we understand that Jesus is also King of Kings. So we understand when Jesus takes us to a yet higher revelation of authority, we become kings. As a king, a king has a greater and wider authority than a lord. Instead of simply administering the laws, kings can make laws. Ooh. <laughs> we have to begin to understand the responsibility the Father has given a friend. Right. You know, I can walk up to a stranger and say, give me a thousand dollars. When I do it, uh, he'll feel like he's getting mugged and probably give me a thousand dollars. Or he'll call the police and I get arrested. Mm -hmm. But if I walk up to a friend of mine and ask for a thousand dollars, there's a much greater possibility that I'm going to get it. Right? Because of relationship. And the Father wants us to get to that understanding where the closer you are to Him, the easier it is for Him to reveal and give to you that which you are uh, in authority over. Right. Because the responsibility you are called to will elevate to your financial state. How are you guys doing? We grow to sons. But Jesus, in, 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 in turn, is uh, uh, 
not want, does not want us to remain just in relationship with Him, but also leads us to the Father. That's the key. It's not just about Jesus. Right? It's all about Jesus. No, Jesus is the foundation. Right? right? And as a matter of fact, it's really all about the kingdom and the king of the kingdom. And the king of the kingdom is not just Jesus. Right. And don't misunderstand me. It's Yahweh. Right. That's why I engage the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, I get to the fullness of Yeshua. And through Yeshua, I get to the fullness of Yahweh, the, Yeho the Father. Which means I get to engage the fullness of the Yah, the head of Al the head. Yeah. I get to engage Yahweh. All of who God is in its full capacity. But I get to do that as a spirit being. Right. How are you guys doing? Right. As we get into that relationship with the Father, we can operate as sons. Sons operate in a whole different level of authority and power than the lords and kings. This is a process and a journey of training which all starts with surrender. I can only become a son if I first become a servant. That's where we started off. Right? And, and to be honest, it never really makes sense to me. But if I now look at my children, my, my oldest son would say, You know, Dad, I'm not a slave. Because, Torrent, don't you want to do this? Torrent, don't you want to do that? Because he can. Right? <laughs> so his mentality is, Dad, I'm not a slave in this house. Well, actually, that's the only reason I made you. <laughs> and made you to make me coffee. And to take the dust bill, the rubbish bin out. And to tidy up the lounge. No, not really, but right, yeah. he, he feels like that because I ask him to do stuff. Will you look after the kids? I need to go somewhere. Do this, do that. Because he's the oldest. That's his responsibility. Yeah, he gets fed. <laughs> yeah, he, gets, he eats everything. He just moves. <laughs> the Father just wants us to begin to understand as we grow in intimacy and relationship, the responsibility gets more. I don't ask my four year old to make me coffee. He'll burn himself and everything around him and make a big mess. I mean, he just walks through the house and it ends up a big mess. <laughs> but the older you get, the more responsibility you have. So the more intimate you grow with Yahweh, the more he can trust you. You know, I, my son has wanted a knife, a pocket knife, for the last three years. But myself and my wife, we go to Walmart and we leave Torin and Kewen at home. There's a package that comes for Torin. He reads and he says, and he takes a, a knife and cuts it open and cuts his finger. Nothing serious. But of course, he calls us and it's blood and guts. We leave everything right there, rush home, and there's this little cut on his finger that barely bleeds. But I realized, well, he's not responsible enough for the knife. He doesn't know enough for me to get him one, but he's one in a pocket knife. Now, in America, it's, everyone's got a pocket knife. Yeah. So, over time, I said to him, when I feel I can trust you with a pocket knife, I will get you one. So, Christmas came, and I thought, you know, I think that he's at the place where I can get him a pocket knife. And so far, so good. He's grown into the... Spot, a responsible position where I can look at him and say, you know what, I'm going to get you a pocket knife. Because I think, I think you're not going to stab your brother with it. I think that you're not going to take it to school and do something weird with it. And he's actually very responsible. But he had to grow into that position. Now, I always say this to my, my kids. I'm not your friend. I'm your father. Right, but we act like friends, but he knows I'm his father. And I make that clear, because we can play together now, but do something wrong, and I'm going to have to disciple you, or dis discipline you. Right? And that's where the father wants us to get to. That's where obedience is key in our relationship. Because in that place of obedience, if I know that my son listens to me, I get to trust him more. And I reveal to him more. My kids get to the age now where they're going to start coming with me to the meetings. Not all of them, thank you Jesus. But the older ones will come to the meetings and they will sit in the meetings. Because I don't want to church my kids. Well, 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 what do you mean you don't want to church your kids? I don't like the system. It's unbiblical. Father wants to get us to the place where we are equipped. 
Now we understand, in the intimacy that he longs, the desire he has for you is to be equipped in who you are. Wow. Walk with the seven spirits. Engage with the angelic. Go into the kingdom of heaven and find yourself at the throne with the 24 elders. Go into Yahweh and engage the 22 letters. Understand that there's just too much out there for me to go into, to learn from, and for the Father to pour into me, than for me to sit on this side of the veil, wanting to build up my faith so I can trust in Him. Because when I enter in the veil, I don't need the measure of faith I need on this side, because I enter into another dimension of faith. Because on this side of the fence, or this side of the veil, I haven't seen Him, I haven't touched Him, I haven't walked with Him. But beyond the veil, I have seen Him, touched Him, walked with Him, my faith shifts to another place. And that's what he longs for. And that's where intimacy comes, it becomes key. Because in that level of intimacy, he opens up gateways and doorways for me to go into with and feels knowledge and understanding of who I am. And that's when he entrusts me to do things in the earth, to align things and to propel creation back into place. Yes. It's his heartbeat and his desire for us to step into that position and become friends of Yahweh in the measure that he's desired for us to be in, right? Yes. Yeah. Let's stand. Father, I, I want to thank you tonight that you have made a way for us yeah. to step into your, to your presence. And by faith, we take that step into your presence right now, into the realm of your presence. Everyone in this room, we step into that place right now, Father. And we ask you to forgive us for not fully surrendering to, to the absolute governance of your kingdom in our lives. Uh, today, Yeshua, we are um, willfully uh, and with desire... Um, educated the, uh, educating the throne uh, of our hearts so that we can sit with you and get to gain the knowledge that you want to pour into us so that we can come and see, sit uh, ourselves as Lord and as King in front of you, Father, knowing that you Lord over us and you literally begin to pour over us all that we need. We surrender right here at the seat of rest, uh, at the mountain uh, by your throne. Father, we step into all of who you are and we take as the domain and the governance that's in your hand and we walk out with everything you have given us, everything you've desired for us as we engage into the heavens, as we open our hearts and begin to literally step into all of who you are. Father, we give you the key to our hearts. We, we literally allow you and ask that you will have us be a gateway and a doorway um, with everything that's possibly wanting to enter in from your kingdom into all of who we are. So we can run with what you've made available and become the sons and the daughters and the friends that you've longed for us to be. Father, I look at the sons and daughters in the earth and I see the extreme change that's taking place in the ecclesia. I look at the company of people in front of me and I see the extreme change that's taking place in their lives. But Father, this year coming, 2019, I ask Father that you open us up for dimensions and realms. Let us begin to walk in the supernatural at levels we've never experienced. You have said to us that there will be a time when we bring the spiritual matter into a physical matter, where we begin to speak out of the kingdom of heaven into the earth and create things that needs to fall into place. So Father, tonight I ask that as we step in, that you open our hearts up, that you will teach us and train us to become what we need to be. Let's become friends of Yahweh and walk with you in levels and dimensions we never thought possible. The veil has been torn and we get to walk with you, we get to step in. But Father, our responsibility is to gain friendship and intimacy with you. So I ask you to open us up and let's walk deep with you, Father. We love you. We praise you. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen.